All right, I am here today with Michael Levine. And Michael, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where might people know you from? Oh, thanks for having me. Um, you might know me from Twitter, I guess. I, I tweet a bit or X, whatever we call this this hellscape now. Um, but you also <laughs> might know me from the Mono White Guys, from uh, the Mind Sculptors podcast, where I do a lot of episodes, usually about stacks decks, uh, sometimes set reviews, whatever you know Callahan decides we want to talk about. Um, I mostly play Legacy and, and CDH, so you may have seen me some posts about Legacy. I, I, I play Paper and uh, MTGO Legacy, but I think I'm primarily known uh, for playing CDH, primarily as the, the podcast the Mono White Guys might give away for playing a lot of Mono White decks. And you've had some success recently with one CDH deck in particular. Yeah, so um, recently at the Star City Games Baltimore, they had their first CDH 5K, and I I was lucky enough to to come in the top four for that. Um, So that that was a great event, and I I played kind of my classic mono-white deck, which is Heliod Suncrowned. Uh, So it's Heliod Ballistic Combo with some relevant stacks pieces, um, you know, and and all the engines that deck needs to keep up with maybe the so-called better decks of things like Timna Krom or, or Timna Thrasios. So it's a deck I really like. I, I used to play it quite a bit in tournaments when, when tournaments started becoming big. Um, I, I top four to a number of events. Uh, the deck kind of fell off as all of the partner decks just kept getting better and better cards. Um, but I felt like, you know, the, the meta right now is a good place for Heliod. So I decided to bring it. It was kind of last minute. I almost played Rocco instead, which I, I know uh, you've talked about my Rocco deck on the podcast before, but uh, I decided Heliod last minute, thanks to some new tech, uh, and it it worked pretty well. And that new tech is what we're here to talk about today. In particular, you chose to include a few cards in the list that seem like they may have fundamentally shifted the way you approach the game, and those cards being cards which enabled you to operate at instant speed. So just a quick coverage from the mechanical standpoint, we are probably going to be saying flash and instant speed a lot interchangeably with this because we're personally, I started all the way back in fourth edition in ice age and instant speed was just the way we talked about things. So I apologize in advance if I am inconsistent with my language with it, but for a quick mechanical primer, If something has flash or something is an instant, it can be cast whenever you have priority. And you can find out about more about how that works if you want to check out our episode on mastering the stack. It essentially lets you cast permanent spells whenever you could, well, cast an instant. And I guess one question here is why didn't we just make everything operate at instant speed? I mean, I think it's very good we didn't make everything operate at instant speed. you know, there, there's certain there, there's two reasons, both from a, a feel good gameplay perspective, and I think for the game as a, a competitive game. Um, when you first start playing Magic, I think the worst feeling you you encounter is when someone uses something like giant growth during combat and just blows you out. The the not seeing a card coming that just fundamentally ruins whatever strategy you had in mind can feel pretty bad and if every card was an instant it would really just be a series of i didn't know you had that card now i feel feel very very bad um so that that's good from a enjoyable gameplay perspective but i also think from making the game competitive um there needs to be some trade-offs uh and i think the the trade-off for example between sorceries and instants is is an interesting one from competitive gameplay perspective sorceries usually have slightly more powerful effects but of course you can only do them on your turn you sacrifice the ability the flexibility of waiting until you see what they do you have to make your decisions earlier but you get this this benefit of a a larger effect and i think that is is really important to the game and and choosing how you want to structure your deck do you want to play proactively or reactively um and that that decision that ability even sometimes to pivot between those two modes makes it really, really interesting from a competitive point of view. So why are we talking about Flash now in 2023? What in particular has changed that now suddenly 
Flash is something that is in the discussion. I mean, didn't Flash get banned? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's actually funny because, you know, these kinds of ways to do things at instant speed that shouldn't be done at instant speed traditionally, that's been part of CDH for a while. Um, the, you know, the the first deck that really used this was, was Zer. So Zer is a, a cool deck because, you know, you put Zer in play, you attack, and you usually get to immediately put Necropotence on the board. And Necropotence is a very powerful card. One life for one card is is really good. But the problem with Necropotence is that you lose those cards. You you know you exile them at the end of turn. You put them in your hand, and you have to discard. And one part of Necropotence, one drawback, is that if you were put a card that you discard in your graveyard, instead it gets exiled. So you really lose those cards forever. So the Zer players were kind of the first people to be like, what if somehow we could cast all these spells at instant speed? And there was really only one way to do it back in the day. That was Shimmer Mirror, which is a three mana 2-2 two, two flash that gives all your artifacts flash. So now Zara could put the Necropotence in play, draw a bunch of cards, and at least try to play all the mana rocks. Um, and, and that was, you know, a powerful deck. But as you mentioned, there was a more powerful deck that used the flash mechanic, uh, which used the namesake card flash. So the, this was like the first idea of what if you could give any spell flash um, it was a one chorus, one blue instant where you could put a creature into play at instant speed, um, but you had to pay the rest of the cost essentially, or it would go to the graveyard. Uh, now, this is even better than just giving a creature flash because in Flash Hulk, what you would do is you tap for two, cast flash, put your Protean Hulk into play, not pay the remaining four, let it die, and then get its death trigger, which is how you won the game. Um, but the idea was that, you know, Flash didn't just put it into play and then into the graveyard. It let you do it at instant speed, which meant any time a player had a one colorless and one blue open, they could win the game. Sometimes they didn't even need that. You know, one blue and nothing else could mean Simeon Spirit Guide. It could mean Elvish Spirit Guide. Um, that's kind of the scariness of giving cards that should not be played as instants the ability to be played as instants. It, it, the flash got banned and, and one of the reasons I think it got banned not just for being powerful if that card had been a sorcery we'd be in a very different position the fact that someone could go to flash and someone could cast another flash on top of them and win at instant speed on top of another person made the game very stressful and, and unpleasant uh, and I think it really speaks to why we don't just give everything flash <laughs> and yeah I remember playing in flash hulk meta and Going for what seemed like a sure thing win that I've got it. I'm all set up. I'm going to I've got two layers of protection here going, fighting off those counter spells, forcing my win through for the flash hole player to say, no, no. And, and I win instead. And that's really one of the powerful things in general about being able to do things at instant speed. In the case you just described, other people exhausted their resources to stop you and another player had a window because they could do it at instant speed. Um, and, and that is, you know, why it is so powerful to be able to just cast spells on other people's turns whenever you need to, you can always identify a window. It's not about having the window on your turn. It's about there ever being a window whatsoever. Um, and I, I think that kind of leads to the, the next card that people used that, that enabled flash, uh, which is emergent zone. So I feel like people, this is a controversial card. A lot of players hate it because it's a land that produces colorless mana and they want to play four and five color decks. Um, but it's also a land that says one tap sack it, cast spells as though they had flash until end of turn. That means, like in the scenario you described, any deck could now try to do its combo at instant speed. And, and that's really, really powerful. You know, you hear about players wanting to play the instant speed extra turn effects because they can create a window for themselves. That's essentially what Emergent Zone does. It says for two, basically two mana, because you have to tap and sack the land, um, you get to try right now. And, and that's that's incredibly powerful. Most of the decks that were using this were like decks using Breach, for example, Underworld Breach combo decks, because you have to be mana efficient if you're going to use two just to turn on the instant speed. Um, but it's really powerful and it feels quite bad when someone says, you know, I'll crop rotation my land into emergent zone, crack my emergent zone, and you realize that you just lost out of nowhere. 
so I, I think it's a really powerful effect. It is unfortunate. It's colorless land. I'm happy that the four and five color decks don't just get to use it with no penalty. Uh, but it's a, it's a really powerful card, and it's probably the most common instant speed enabler in CDH right now. It seemed like it was very prominent a while ago after the card was first printed, and a lot of people were trying to le relive the glory days of Flash Hulk, of trying to jam their win out at instant speed. But it seemed like it had a little bit of a falling out among the CDH community, possibly just because it was a real cost to ask those four and five color decks to jam in a land that taps for colorless only. Yeah, I think as more legacy players have come in, actually, they were some of the initial people to point out, you're really ruining your mana base by playing this land that often you don't even use to do the thing it, it does. Um, every turn it's in play and you're not using it to win and no one's respecting the fact that it's in play. You've just really put yourself almost a turn behind because you, you often just can't even use it to cast any of the spells in your hand. Um, but yeah, it, it turns out when all of the decks play a lot of one and two mana spells, you don't have a lot of opportunities to use colorless mana. And I, I think these four color decks uh, didn't quite realize that initially, but but now it's a little rarer that you see emergent zone uh, in these in these lists. Okay, so let's fast forward then. We're past the era where everybody tried to make emergent zone work. Now there's a couple decks that are using it, but. Now we've got some new tools that have come out in the past calendar year. So what has changed and what kind of things really drew you to look again at your mono white Heliod list? Yeah, so there's been a little bit of change in design. Uh, so, and this has been, been said by Wizards of the Coast that they would give white more flat creatures with flash. So they've actually been printing a lot of creatures with flash, which I, as a, as a mono white player who likes to use creatures, I've been very happy about that. But they've also leaned into giving colorless cards flash. And in particular, they've been leaning into what if you could cast artifacts and colorless cards specifically with flash. And and the first card that, that really showcased that was the Liberator, Urza's Battle Thopter. Uh, I really like that card. It's basically a better Shimmer Mirror because not only can you do your artifacts have flash, your colorless spells do as well, which... You know, for a lot of decks, that doesn't matter. Sometimes it does. And it just has some extra text on it, right? It flies. It There's a few times it gets some counters. Um, but it's also, you know, people have built CEDH decks, Liberator CEDH decks, where the whole idea is just to play Mana Rocks and colorless draw spells and some colorless stacks effects and go over people and, and keep everyone on edge because from the turn Liberator enters the battlefield, you know, a graft of your skate could come out of nowhere and get you. So that that's a really interesting card. And I remember when it came out, I had already been starting to play Shimmer Mirror and Heliod. And then I said, well, now I have two of these effects. I'm going to put Liberator in Heliod. And when they were doing well, I said, oh, no, <laughs> I had a, I should put Emergent Zone in Heliod. I, I, <laughs> I said, oh, that worked pretty well. What about Winding Canyons? That's kind of the original Give Creatures Flash land it's from a uh, weather light i believe and it's a colorless producing land with two tap it uh you can cast creatures as though they had flash until under turn so you know if your hate bears cost two mana it basically says well for five you now have instant speed hate bears and and that's really good it, it's really good specifically in heliod because all of these effects enable casting walking bliss at instant speed um so that's that's really important and in particular in heliod um you are playing cards like Rule of Law. So when people can only play one spell for a turn, being able to cast Walking Ballista after they've cast their spell for a turn is, is very powerful. It's like getting free counter magic out of nowhere. Um, so Liberator was really the, the, it opened kind of the floodgates for me. I, I got so excited and all of a sudden I was like, how do I put more and more instant speed enabling effects in the deck? And, and I actually, I remember decided to change the name on the primer um, now I, I call the deck Flash Cannon, which is a, a you know homage to, to Pokemon, oh <laughs> to, to Registeel's oh. uh, attack Flash Cannon. But the idea is that you're flashing in Walking Ballista, who's kind of like this uh, Registeel-esque cannon uh, to win the game. So, I mean, I for me, Liberator was really the turning point where I said there's enough of these effects that I could put in my deck um, that that I should really focus on this as a 
as a way to win the game with essentially protection. Okay, okay. And then most recently in the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth set, we got another Flash Enabler in the form of Gandalf the White. And Gandalf the White is five mana, three white white for a four or five legendary creature avatar wizard with flash. And importantly, you may cast legendary spells and artifact spells as though they had flash. Yeah, Gandalf is, it, you know, when you think of CDH decks, you don't normally think of five mana creatures that don't have an ETV effect. But Gandalf is, is really nice because it also lets you cast Heliod uh, at instant speed. And that's really important. And actually, the deck plays a lot of Legends. One of the the kind of consequences of WotC designing for Commander is that now lots of creatures are legendary creatures. So it just turns out that some of the best white creatures are Legends, so now you can cast those for free. Um, Gandalf is a, is a really interesting card. There, it has this secondary effect, right? Also, it's uh, it doubles ETVs for Legends and Artifacts. And the deck already plays a lot of artifacts and legends with ETVs, so that's nice. It also doubles the leave the battlefield effects, although my deck doesn't actually have any of those, so that, that text doesn't really exist for me. But it, it's it's an objectively powerful card. It, I mean, it, it's powerful in other decks. I think people are actually sleeping on it. For example, in Rocco, it lets you do all of Food Shade combo at instant speed. Because it doubles oh your... Oh my god, it does. Yeah, it doubles your Rocco trigger, uh, which lets you put Rector in a creature that deals damage to Rector in play. Uh, and then when you have your food chain, your Rocco gets squeeze, squeeze a legend. So now you can make infinite mana at instant speed and, and Rocco infinite times. So I, I feel like there's a lot of uses <laughs> for Gandalf, but, <laughs> but people don't, uh, you know, it just seems a little bit, maybe like a more casual card. It costs a lot of mana. It does a flashy thing, but it's, it's not affecting the board right away. But I think that if you're a deck that can slow the game down and pass the turn with mana up, you know, once this card resolves, everyone has to be very scared at all times. So I, I think it's a very powerful card. And then I know it's not seeing play in your Heliod list due to the rules of Commander saying we can only include cards that have our color identity with it. But Lord of the Rings Tales of Metal Earth also gave us Born Upon a Wind, a card that tries to look like Flash. One and a blue for an instant. You may cast spells this turn as though they had Flash and draw a card yeah that that card you know there this is like emergent zone in that people have very strong opinions of whether this card is amazing or if it's awful oh um, yes they do yes two, two mana investment you know the same as emergent zone that really bothers people that you have to invest mana and a card to to get the effect now this one replaces itself and i think people don't always acknowledge how good a two mana spell that draws a card is because when you can't use it, you can easily cycle it at the end of turn. Um, and, and a card like Born Upon the Wind can just draw counter spells to begin with. You know, it's not a spell people really want to resolve. Because once it's active, you don't really know what's going to happen. So I think it's, it's you know, probably a very powerful card for blue decks in general. Like Urza should be playing this card. But... I could see why some of the four and five color decks feel the same way they do it about Emergent Zone, where it's a large commitment mana wise, um, and it doesn't do anything else. You know, Emergent Zone at least could tap for mana on the turns you're not using it. Born Upon a Wind is, you know, just in your hand sitting there until you want to use it. And the minute you decide to use it just to draw a card, you know, you've given up on that plan. There's no alternative mode that lets you maintain your, your flash plan. I still think it's a powerful card and I feel like there will be some one and two color decks that are going to use this. And when you lose to it, you're going to feel really stupid if you are a hater of this card. <laughs> <laughs> so from what you've described, it looks like there really are two main benefits that we've identified so far to being able to play at instant speed. You described first kind of the ability to win the game at instant speed, winning on top of it which we've gone into a little bit of depth so far, talking about the history of Flash Hulk, and then what the cards you added to Heliod Ballista combo enabled. Are there any other thoughts you have on winning the game in instant speed? 
before we go on to the other major dynamic that it changes about the game. Yeah, I think winning at instant speed is is often, you know, people talk about it like it's this amazing thing when your deck can do it. I remember when the Magda deck got popular, people were saying it can win at any time. It's so hard to interact with. And that I think that's actually the main benefit of winning at instant speed. You know, someone casts a wheel and you win in response and they probably don't have anything in their hand. That's why they cast that wheel. It, it's hard to interact when someone is responding to your way to search for interaction by casting their spells. And that is one of the, the real powerful components of, of instant speed wins. The winning on top of people feels really nice. I think it happens a little less than people like to say it does. Um, people usually, you know, there is this kind of folklore that you never go off. You never try to go off first, right? You you let someone go first and then you go after them. And winning on top of them feels like the ultimate version of that. But I think often it's more of just presenting that option that scares people. You know, when an emergent zone is in play, people know that you could go off on top of them. They play more responsibly. And it, it changes the entire flow of the game, often in a way that you don't actually win by going off on top of them, but maybe just the option to scared people into playing a different way that benefited you. And I think that is something that permanents that give Flash um, really add to the game because then they know it's there. You know, Born Upon a Wind, if it's in your hand, people might not even respect that it could be in your hand. They have no reason to believe it is. The minute they see Emergent Zone in play or Shimmer Mer in play, you know, they will start playing differently and that can be used towards your advantage. Okay. And in particular, you noted that your mono white deck is unsurprisingly very heavy into stacks effects. How does the ability to play at instant speed with stacks effects in particular change the dynamics of the game? Yeah. One of the, the things about stacks effects that is uh, sometimes, you know, disappointing, I guess you could say is that, um, you know, everyone knows they're there. Ones that don't have flash, the minute they're on the board, people know that, you know, oh, your graph diggers in play, I'm not going to cast my underworld breach. And then they just wait until they have their removal spell. And when they had their removal spell, you know, the cards that it was stopping are still in their hand. So now it's effectively, you know, they've drawn a bunch of cards, a bunch of dead cards are, are alive again. But if you can hold your graph diggers cage in hand, and only cast it in response to their breach, you know, now you've actually taken a card out of their hand and you've taken it out of their hand permanently. That is is a lot more powerful. Now your stacks pieces are like counter spells. And now you're more like a control deck than you are a traditional like prison-esque stacks deck. Um, so I personally really like getting to commit some things to the board, but not everything. Um, it, it, you know, sometimes it feels real bad when someone, you know, just blows up everything and you have no more cards in hand because you've really just overcommitted. Um, when you cast things at instant speed, you're more incentivized to not overcommit to the board, but you can still interact with people if you need to. And then if something bad happens, you know, someone's like Conicris, you have a bunch of cards you can maybe even cast at instant speed. I have definitely after a Cyclonic Rift resolved, you know, floated mana, casted Shimmer Mirror, put everything back into play. That's a really nice mechanic that you gain from some of these permanent based ones, something you can do with Emergent Zone. Um, so it, it changes the flow quite a bit for a stack deck uh, in a way that I, I really like. It's why I used to play Ether Vial. Um, ironically, I just removed Ether Vial uh, because they previewed a new card in the Commander uh, Master set another flash enabler <laughs> so either vial is gone and now my three mana colorless uh insect that g gives colorless spells flash uh will be entering the mix oh that's our cicada yeah exactly the actual name of it uh, i'll have it up on the screen thanks to future john yes it, that card is very cool too it has this effect that when you cast colorless spells it gets uh plus x plus x and trample where x is the mana value uh, and in Heliod, I feel I'm hoping that I'll get some people with some weird things where, you know, I go to swing and I flash in the one ring and they get hit for six. I think that'll be, I don't know, fun. I don't think it'll ever win me the game, but I love the idea of 
surprise, you just got hit by a gigantic insect to the face. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, So that's how the Flash kind of changes the dynamic of stacks, decks. That's kind of how it affects how decks can win the game. Are there other ways that playing permanence out or sorceries out at instant speed changes the dynamic of how a game of Commander flows? Well, it gives you a lot more uh, places to make choices. Uh, one of the things that you learn when you start playing Magic is that you shouldn't cast instants on your, your own turn unless there's a really compelling reason to do it because you would like to see what your opponents do before you have to make any decisions. This is especially important, for example, cards that see play in Legacy like Brainstorm, you know, what cards you put back and which ones you keep really matters on what your opponent's doing. So just firing off a brainstorm on your own turn isn't always the best decision. It's often better to wait. Um, And in general, giving more of your spells flash means you have more time to wait, to gain information and make a decision. And when there is four people in a game instead of two, you can get a lot of more information before you lose that ability to cast your spell, right? So if I pass the turn, there are three people's turns where I get to gain some information before I decide what to cast before my next turn begins. So I think that that's really useful. I think that, you know, people don't always want to wait. They, they, there is this kind of tendency to jam, but when you have all these flash enablers and they're going to stick on the board, that's one of the great things about Shimmer, Liberator, Gandalf, um, the Circada, they stay on the board. So now until someone removes that, you are going to be able to wait to make your decisions and you're going to be able to have a lot more information at your hands when you actually start to use your resources. Um, so that that is a really big change in, in how you play. If you really like playing like 60 card decks that are blue, uh, you get to feel like you're playing a blue deck. And because these cards are mostly colorless, you can kind of do it in any deck you want. Um, and, and I think that, that that is a very powerful thing that sometimes gets ignored in favor of, oh, you can win on top of people. Um, There's a lot cooler stuff about the game that changes when you can cast things with Flash. Well, winning over top of people is one of those golden, just golden end goals in CEDH. But when we start to step back into, I guess, more casual or battle cruiser or classic commander, however you like to think of it, how do we start to translate some of these benefits to, I guess, the broader Commander metagame? Yeah, I mean, I think it is fun to cast flashy spells as instance. It's fun when you're, you're when you're with your friends and all of a sudden you cast some stupid big fatty at instant speed in combat. Maybe you block and, and blow out some attack. Um, you know, who doesn't want to cast like a Crater Hoof at instant speed? which basically becomes a plague wind on your opponent who thought they, they had this great alpha strike. You know, there, there's a lot of fun things you can do in more battle cruiser type decks when you can do things at instant speed. Um, it, it does make the game maybe a little more complicated. So if you're just thinking about sitting and having beers with your friends as you play some magic, you know, maybe that's a little rough. Uh, it's a lot of thinking that you're going to be doing. But if you like really want to do fun, complicated, weird things, being able to do them at instant speed really makes it all the more fun. And there have been no shortage of effects that have seen play in casual commander for many years now. I still remember when Josh Lee Kwai of the command zone started really preaching the virtues of the Dalkin Ori. And I know Leyline of anticipation has long been a favorite card at many, many tables. Is there a reason these have not seen a push into CDH, do you think? Yeah, Leyline is one of those cards that, you know, it really gets done a disservice in single card in singleton formats. It's only going to really be good when it's in your opening hand. Four mana, I guess, maybe not that bad for that effect if you're mono blue, because it's still two and two blue. Um, but probably as you go to more colors, one, you're never going to really get it for free, and, and it's going to be a big investment. And I, I think... The other reason, if you go back to the four mana spells, um, these spells don't have flash themselves, right? So you're investing four mana on your turn and then hoping it gets back to your turn where you'll have mana available again to start using their effect. Um, I like the the gameplay of flashing in Shimmer before my next turn 
um, when I have now all my mana available. I don't know that I would like Shimmer Mirror as much if I had to tap out for it on my turn. Everyone knows that once it gets to my turn again, I'm going to have this Flash Enabler online. Uh, it's probably less likely that it makes it to my turn or that someone doesn't try to go off, uh, you know, first before I have mana up to do things. So I think that these two cards, you know, Leyline's great in your opening hand because you get to cast things as instance from the very beginning. And there's a lot of these magical Christmas land uh, 60 card decks that, you know, like the idea of winning on turn zero with Leyline of Anticipation. And I think everyone has that in their head. They're going to have it turn one. They're going to play a land and on everyone else's turn, they're going to play like a million mana rocks or something. Uh, but it's probably not going to happen. You're probably not going to have it in your opening hand. You're going to cast it for four mana on turn three or turn four and, and pass the turn. So I'm not a, a big fan of that. But in casual decks, you know, you're more able to to do things like that. Like That's kind of the point of casual commander, right? To be able to play these higher cost spells, just slam them on board, pass the turn. You're going to get another turn. If there's if, you know, you have four mana, your opponent's only have four mana, you're not losing the game in a casual pod right there. And you're going to have a turn or two with your Ori online. So I think it makes a lot of sense for, from the casual perspective to try these effects out. I mean, I think if I was playing a casual blue deck, I would probably always put Leyline in because it's just too fun when you do have it to, to deny it. Um, but certainly in CDH, it, it becomes a little more of an investment. And usually when we're talking about CDH, four mana cards should win you the game. You know, people think maybe the one ring isn't good enough in Commander because it's four mana. It doesn't win you the game. Uh, but if you've been looking at Modern or Legacy, you'll see that that card basically always wins you the game when you cast it for four mana. Uh, so it has to be, I think spells have to be at least as good as the one ring uh, to, to see play in competitive EDH at four mana instant uh, uh, sorcery speed. Uh, I also like that card because of course with Shimmer Mirror, I can cast that as an instant. You know, it's very fun to give yourself protection from everything at instant speed. There's a lot of decks that will be very unhappy when you flash that in. So I, I am a true believer of the one ring, but I think in our format, competitively, it, it's hard to ask uh, people to play four mana sorcery speed permanents that don't do a lot when they enter the battlefield. All right. Well, before we finish up, let's go ahead and kind of address one of the other big options you could potentially use. Literally building around a commander who gives your whole deck or portions of your deck essentially flash. And the the OG of this would be good old fashioned Yiva Nature's Herald Two green green for a four four legendary creature elf shaman with flash. And you may cast green creature spells as though they had flash. Now, there was definitely a time when Yiva was seeing a lot of play at CDH tables right there alongside Yisan as kind of the two big mono green decks I remember playing against a lot. Yeah, and, and they're both ultimately decks trying to operate at instant speed, right? Because one of the nice things about Yisan is you can activate Yisan's ability at instant speed and put creatures in play at instant speed. You know, you get even more out of it because you put them at, into play at instant speed from your library. Uh, I actually used to play Lin Sivi, which is another card that lets you put creatures into play at instant speed from your library. I think those effects are good both in casual and high power. Um, in CDH, I think Yiva is, is not quite as good as it used to be. If you've ever lost a Yiva, you think that deck is amazing. Um, when you've beaten Yiva, that deck often did not much. Um, but it seems like it would be very, very fun in, in, as a casual deck. I, I think a casual mono green deck Yiva is very cool, um, especially for the kind of person who likes to do weird things in combat like blow people out with with creatures <laughs> and then in more recent years during our first return to dominaria in a dog's age we got an azorius version of this in raf capuchin ship's mage two white blue for a three three legendary creature human wizard with flying flash and you may cast historic spells as though they had flash so artifacts, legendaries, and sagas count as historic. Yeah, Raph is is pretty good. I actually am surprised there's not a very powerful CDH Raph deck. I think four mana is maybe a lot for that effect, and it's telegraphed, right? So when I cast a Shimmer Mirror for my hand, no one knows it's coming. The Raph deck has Raph on the table sitting there for everyone to see. Everyone knows when Raph is going to be cast. Um, but... 
it is a really powerful effect in colors that can really use those effects, right? So a lot of the artifact and legend based combos are in white and blue. I mean, you could literally do Heliod Ballista combo in that deck at instant speed with Raph. Um, there's a lot of reasons Raph could actually be a great choice as a commander <laughs> in a high powered or even CDH deck. I, I, I hope one day someone just breaks this card. It's just, you know, CDH has this problem where if your commander isn't a combo piece or a value engine, it's often a hard sell for a competitive deck. Uh, and while Raph is an enabler, it, it doesn't really create any value that is tangible. It's all virtual value, you know. There is something to say about your cards becoming more powerful uh, in that you are essentially saving on mana. For, you're getting a more powerful effect for the same cost. Um, but it, it, that's all it does. When your hand's empty and you only have Wrath, it doesn't feel very good. There's no like top deck win the game. Um, so that's probably why it and I think the next Azorius Flash Commander don't see that much play at the time. Mm -hmm. And that next Azorius Flash Commander is Heliod the Radiant Dawn out of March of the Machine. Two white white for a legendary creature god without indestructible or devotion. And when Heliod ETBs as a 4-4, you can return a non-god enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. And you have an activated ability of 3 and a blue Phyrexian mana, so either a blue mana or 2 life. Transform Heliod as a sorcery into Heliod the Warped Eclipse. A 4-6 legendary enchantment creature Phyrexian God, which says you may cast spells as though they had flash. And spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card your opponents have drawn this turn. Yeah, I mean, this card, like, I was already playing the flash effects in Heliod at the time. So when this version of Heliod got printed, I was like, someone was listening to me at WotC. Heliod and flash effects go perfectly together. Unfortunately, this Heliod does not, you know, combo with Walking Ballista. Um, you can't play this Heliod inside of Heliod Suncrown because it technically has an Azorius color identity because of the Phyrexian mana cost. That's something that, you know, I really wish they would change I, it in hybrid mana cost, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, <laughs> the, the, the one problem with this Heliod is that, uh, as you mentioned, one, transforming it is a sorcery, and two, it costs a lot of mana to transform. So it's going to be seven mana to have a transformed Heliod in play, unless you have some kind of other tricks. Um, that's quite a bit. And you're going to have to transform it on your own turn. So it's not only, you know, four mana to put in play, but next turn you're going to pay three mana or four mana to, to have your Ori effect in online. Um, that being said, I, I really like that they are just playing with this design space this much. Um, it is, it you know, this Heliod shows that they're really willing to mess around in this design space and that they are really committed to the idea that white and magic should have flash enablers. Right, because Heliod is, you know, the 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 white god. It is supposed to embody white effects. That's why the first one made enchantment creatures. The second one did things with life gain and pumping your creatures. You know, printing this Heliod as a flash enabler really signals that they think white should have flash enablers. Obviously, they clearly feel this way about blue. <laughs> you know, Wrath, um, the the born into the winds, like. This is Born Upon a Wind. Th these are pretty strong hints that they want these two colors to be able to cast things at instant speed that other colors can't. And and I personally welcome that. Give me more hate bears with flash, more things that give my hate bears flash, and I'll be very happy. Uh, it's too bad that this Heliod cannot be played in my Heliod deck, but uh, you can't win them all. I think I won enough this year. <laughs> <laughs> the year is still not over that though michael oh uh, wait they just need to give me a doctor that also gives my my spells flash or some crazy sonic screwdriver card and i will be you know over the moon oh uh, who would that be though which doctor hasn't I know. been spoiled yet who could be coming in at instant speed so i, mean, I was the nine maybe i was also thinking too the second doctor he's kind of this you know weirdo who just shows up in weird places at weird times i feel like i mean i feel like the doctor having flash is very thematic he just shows up whenever he shows up when he's not expected 
but uh, obviously they couldn't just give all of the doctors flash but it would be great if they did i think that the doctors are all seemingly going to be blue based so that probably won't happen although a lot of the companions are are white so maybe that will be maybe they'll give me something fun as long as they give me a sonic screwdriver that is a cool card that i can play in my deck competitively i'll be very happy <laughs> that, that would be pretty sweet well michael thank you again for coming on and joining us before we wrap up why don't you tell everybody again where people can find you yeah so you can find me on twitter or x or whatever it's called today uh, at michael v levine um, you can find me on the mind sculptors podcast uh, and also the kind of sub show the mono white guys I hang out a lot of the discords. I'm a mod over at the, the mono white discord. Uh, and I hang out at the rule of law discord. I hang out at a lot of discord. So if you have questions about Heliod or, or you want to enable some flash strategies in your other decks, uh, feel free to reach out. I love talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, and I want more people to be playing these flash enablers in their decks. All right. Well, I know I have at least one person who is going to be excited to hear that Fram you heard it get on talking with michael about that idea you had yep get, get in my dms and, and we can start talking all right thanks again for joining us i hope you really enjoyed this episode you can find us on twitter or x or whatever else it has become by the time this episode goes live at gemstone mine mtg you can reach send us an email at gemstone mine podcast at gmail.com or you can find us on youtube where we are gemstone mine podcast until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mine.